have a lot of um, credit. <laughs> um, they use their credit pretty aggressively still. Um, they're not really ready to, to part with a, a substantial sum of money. So the best way to get your foot in the door there is again to say, hey, we're not asking for $100,000. Why don't you put us in your plan, your estate plan? All of a sudden, well, that's doable. I don't have to give anything now. Now, why do we do that? One of the reasons is that if it's in their planning, A, they remember us. Hopefully, we're building good relationships with them. Um, but that also is likely to change um, and turn into more of a significant gift as they get older as well, and their children have left the household and maybe they're utilizing less credit. Um, so we see a lot of those um, types of individuals who, again, use, utilize bequests more than others. Um, charitable gift annuities. So we were talking about the charitable gift annuities. And remember, they're, that's a person who's still receiving an income, um, even though they've given an asset. These tend to be more single women over the age of 65. Now, some people say, well, why women and not men? I hear that a lot. Um, are men diverse? It's not just something that people see in their practice, it's just statistics, if I can say that on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of times when people are planning for their death or their disability, we actually plan for husbands to die first. Um, not usually by just a few years either, by 10 or 15. It's actually quite common. So um, that's why we kind of say single women over 65. Um, again, a lot of times they're living on fixed incomes and they're worried about having that future income stream, but yet they still want to give. Um, where the attraction really comes is they're guaranteed an income stream. It's not gonna go away. Once they have it, that's what it is. The market doesn't play a part, nothing else plays a part, they get X amount of dollars every month. And that's huge for them, um, for that security. The other reason charitable gift annuities work well um, for this category of people is again, um, women are less aggressive with their money. They tend to be more conservative um, so they definitely are not looking at just writing a $100,000 check and saying, ah, it'll be fine, I'll have enough money. That's not generally our women givers. And again, everything I'm talking about is generalized. Um, I understand there's people that don't fit in these profiles, um, but it does help to have an established donor profiles. And if a planned giving program tends to be the right fit for a charity, this is what we do. We sit down and we go through who are our givers and we start making profiles ourselves in-house. Um, again, we can start with some of what the research shows us uh, nationwide, but we'll kind of tailor everything we do here. The charitable remainder trust, um, and again, this is someone gets an income, but the remainder of that asset comes back to the charity after a set number of years. Um, these tend to be more of our wealthy donors, like we kind of talked about. Um, wealthy people between their mid-50s um, to about 70 is where this trust is going to work the best. Um, pretty aggressive fiscally, um, and you can kind of tell from their credit history that they're living a pretty, a, a pretty nice life, pretty upscale life. Uh, and a lot of times, people who set up a charitable remainder trust likely made a gift to the charity in the past already. Um, this isn't going to be someone who's just going to walk off the street, um, just decide to to use us in their charitable remainder trust. Um, they might have given a small gift, a large gift. They might be volunteering, but they're generally going to be somewhat involved. Um, the reason I say that I talk about involvement a lot is really a lot of people setting these things up and choosing Habitat are choosing Habitat because they have a relationship here. Um, people aren't just looking for charities out of home book. So it takes your board, it takes staff members, and it takes the community knowing this is an option and building some of those relationships and staying in touch with them. So hitting the target, again, when it comes to using those profiles to be able to attract more givers, um, the large gift donors, again, are going to be those who will make a major gift in any way, any way, who intend on making some form of planned gift, and those who will do both. And this is where I stress the both. Most of our annual givers will be planned givers if we give them the tools and information to do it. Um, if we don't, then they don't know any better. They don't want to do it. Just like I don't know how to change my oil. <laughs> that little light's got to come on and tell me. Um, most people who do both, you're going to find that the top end of our donor list, people who know our charity the best, that, that 10 to 15 percent of people at the top will actually do both, and very consistently. Um, and that's backed by a number of different research groups. So, good way to start building those long-term, consistent funding for a nonprofit. 
What do you consider, and I know you work with nonprofit, what is that, what's that, what do you consider a major gift? Is it 5,000, 10,000? Does it depend on the nonprofit? Does it depend on analyzing all your data? How do you decide who is, what is a major gift? Yep. So with a lot of my charities, that's a great question. I, I do get that with a lot of my charities. And it really depends on sitting down with your board, I say, and deciding to you what constitutes a major gift. Um, gifts that I see, when I say major gifts, I see a lot of gifts being made over $100,000. I consider that to be a major gift. Um, but you have different categories. So a major gift for you know, this profile might be different than a major gift for your high-end profile. And that's what I would recommend doing is keeping categories and <coughs> what your major gifts are in each category. The reason you want to know per category is because someone who's on the high-end and the low category might be a good person to jump. So they might be a good person to take out to lunch an extra time. Mm -hmm. They might be a good person to ask to join a committee on this so they learn more. Things like that. So we want to know who those people are and where they fit. Um, big part of marketing. So I have a lot of, uh, the last nonprofit I kind of helped through a lot of this, this process and more from the legal side, um, showed me they were really happy. They came up to me, they showed me this for sure they were going to sell it to everyone on their list. It had top 10 ways to do planned gifting. And it went through and talked about everything. It was too much. People are going to look at that. They're not, they, I could not understand half of what was on there because in my head, I'm thinking too technical. I'm like, well, that's just not even accurate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it is at some level. But the biggest thing is simplicity. Um, focusing on one planned gift at a time, I think, is really big. If we go out there tomorrow, and charities will do this, you're all gunned up, we're ready to start planned giving, we're going to start doing everything. That's not realistic. Um, so we need to be good at what we do and grow from there. Um, so direct marketing to the right prospects. Um, I think this is really huge. So let's say with our vehicle and driver analysis, making sure we're staying in one lane. If we have profiled someone um, and we think they are someone who's going to do a specific distribution or request, um, we do not want to be sending them information on charitable lead trusts. Because not only is it not relevant, it's going to start to kind of annoy them after a while. Um, and they're going to ignore marketing. And they're going to ignore letters that may actually hit closer to home, which may actually cause them to give. So we always say trying to tailor that as much as we can um, it does really increase the numbers and the givers that an organization has. Of course, eliminate technical jargon and acronyms. I didn't even use those with you today. I tried to keep things pretty uh, straightforward. Um, we have acronyms for everything, CRT, Charitable Remainder Trust, uh, you'll have Kratz, Kratz. Um, I could probably go on all day. Again, doesn't mean anything to anyone. Charitable Remainder Trust in and of itself doesn't generally mean anything to anyone. So it's simplifying your concept so people understand it. Um, anniversary day asks are also huge with planned giving. So what that means is we always have people who will donate. We know they're going to donate in this quarter. Or we know every month we're going to receive a check from Don and Betty down the street. Um, so it's knowing when do they give their, their donation, essentially. And focus our marketing at that time to say, hey, if this group of people is going to give in this quarter, let's send them something. Let's do that ask at the beginning of that quarter. Not in December when we know they've never given in December. So we want to kind of go after them when it's on their mind. This also helps us eliminate um, mailings and telephone calls and time spent when we know they're not going to give which saves the organization money as well as we're setting up these planned givings um, opportunities. So anniversary day givers tend to be also our best planned giving prospects. Um, again, those are the people who are far more likely to do a planned giving, to utilize a planned giving vehicle for your charity. Um, adopting a segmented solicitation strategy um, if we don't ask the right way, of course, we're never going to get what we need. Um, you know, going up to someone saying, hey, you want to buy Habitat? And you will. They're not just like, yeah, that sounds great. And if they do, fantastic, of course, we'll help them out. <laughs> um, but that's generally not the way um, that this is done. So kind of knowing how are people responding? You know, if we send out a letter, are we getting money back from that? If we're making telephone calls, are we getting things back from that? If this person has lunch or a meeting with a board member or comes to a picnic, is that when they're giving? and tracking that so we know who's giving and what are they giving to. So we're spending our time and our resources on the right things to build that plan giving rather than things that are just never really going to bear any fruit. Um, people who respond to direct mail solicitations, 
um, are also more likely to be good plan giving prospects than those who respond to telemarketing. And I use telemarketing. Um, a lot of small organizations, telemarketing is also just us picking up the phone and calling. That, that counts as telemarketing in my world. Um, but again, the direct mail in person tend to have more of an effect on plan giving um, than anything else. Direct mail gives them the idea, lets them think on it. And then having some type of activity with a board member, a staff member, a committee member is usually what gets us to seal the deal, so to speak. Um, biggest thing is the relationships with our annual givers. So if we want to start plan giving, we have to be building these relationships um, and really start realizing that they are our plan givers. Now, you've heard me say that a few times because it is very true. Um, so we need to make sure that we have that personal touch. And people say, well, that's really time consuming. It is, but the payoff is so much larger, okay? Um, the other thing I always tell people, they're like, well, you know, that personal touch is great. You have to think about it, this actually isn't that hard. And the reason is, if people who are already giving to your charity, you're generally gonna share a similar ideology with. You might actually become friends. We want that. So it's not just like taking someone off the street. This is someone who has a similar shared view as you um, and has a reason to give. So you already have things in common with these people. So building relationships generally isn't difficult. It's just making sure that you're staying in touch. Little things like sending a Christmas card help. Um, and not directly from Habitat, even from a board member. Um, you know, get people involved personally too, if you're willing to do it. Um, or, you know, we say top representatives. Whoever that, those people are in your organization. Um, and this is one where I know Habitat, we don't have a separate planned giving team. But again, just making sure everyone is on the same page. So um, good communicators are huge. Um, like I kind of said at the beginning, one of the things that I find that people have difficult building planned giving uh, programs up is because they filled their team full of attorneys, CPAs, financial representatives, that's great. I mean, they're gonna have the technical knowledge, but can they really communicate with the people that are gonna be your plan givers? We need good communicators more than we need technical expertise at that level because the technical expertise is easy. You bring someone like me and we, can, we bring other people in for that. So it's not so much thinking about, hey, we need all these technical people to start plan giving. We don't, we just need good communicators. And we need our annual team, our fund team to know why plan giving is important and how they actually fit together. So that when they're asked about it and when they're approached, it's not a deer in the headlights look. It's a, hey, I actually know a few things about that. And if I'm not the right person you should talk to, you know what, why don't I have, can I have so-and-so reach out to you? They're great, they'll take you to lunch, have a coffee, whatever it is, however we wanna approach that, but at least give them something to say. So it's not a, well, I think if you go on our website and click that tab, you can read about it. That's, that's not gonna help. But you know what, hey, you know, Lindsay on our board can actually help you out with that. I know she loves meeting with people. Why don't I see if you guys can grab a coffee? You know, and it might be someone where your relationship with is close enough that you say, oh, I know they're not gonna do that unless I go. Go, make the connection. Um, just give them a little bit of information. So that is kind of what the 101 level presentation that I kind of went through. I know there was a lot of information that I threw out there in a very short amount of time, and there's a lot more to plan giving but it kind of gives you an understanding of where we can start planting seeds <coughs> to really grow a more consistent base so we have more funds so we can help more families. Any other questions for me? I could have had more slides. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, and it's a lot of information. Where, um, where would, like, if somebody wants to give you a gift of a stock or a bond, mm -hmm. where does that fit into that? That would be an asset, right? Yep, that's generally appreciated assets. Okay. Um, they can do that in a number of ways. That can be transferred right away, and it can be something transferred at death. So, so we look at that. Right away or at death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, do you, how do you normally see an organization like ours that doesn't have anything like this in place? I think we're kind of a ground startup from the mm -hmm. ground up. Um, how does the next steps typically go? This is usually, um, so the few organizations I've helped in the past with this, this is where, really where they start. They start by just getting information like this and then they put together a team, a committee of people that are more interested in plan giving um, and we get more technical. 
So it just takes sitting down and learning about and deciding what our first initiative is. You learn by running. You don't learn by getting everything ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the world, the charity world anyway. Mm -hmm. If you wait, it's too late. That six trillion is gone. But really with this baby boomer generation passing away and that amount of largest wealth transfer in human history, I mean, really think of that. The largest wealth transfer in human history. It's just disappointing not to see more charities taking advantage of that. So it starts at a committee level and you start by picking a profile. You look at your list that you have now, which grows, and you say, I think I have more people on my list, and this is the profile I think they're gonna fit into, this is where we're gonna start. Where I'm gonna advise people to always look at specific distributions, those bequests, and those annuities, because that's gonna fit 95% of your people. So we start where the numbers are. The bigger gifts, of course, um, can come in the other forms, but if we don't have the beginning set up, we're not gonna get to the bigger gifts. We can't tell people, we're doing charitable lead trusts, you know, here's who we have, we can set these all up, this is great, um, if we don't even know how to handle a gift annuity. It's just not gonna work. So start with the big numbers, and then start with the profile. And usually it starts by realizing that there's more things on our list of people that we track that we need to keep track of. <laughs> um, there's always things like, hey, we're tracking this, this, and this, but we're not tracking this at all. Um, so it's also looking at the list, what are we tracking, and what should we be tracking? Of course, you can always buy a lot of these reports. We don't really want to have to buy more than we need to. Um, but we did look at that with plan giving too. So you're talking buying reports, like getting the historical, like what is their worth, what individual's worth is, okay. Mm -hmm. And comparing it to the donations they've made to Habitat, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Most of those lists over time, when you really have, when you're plan giving, Plan giving takes about five years before you really start seeing things. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a seed. It mm -hmm. doesn't grow very fast. It's not very often we start plan giving and boom, this has been effective. What a great use of our time. It takes about five years. The reason is most people's specific distributions or requests, um, they're most likely to happen if they die within five years of putting them into their estate plan. Otherwise, those people generally uh, evolve into different givers over time. So getting that foot in the door is really important. Um, even if that's not how they end up actually giving the habitat, it usually means they're gonna, that's gonna translate into them giving in bigger and better ways down the road. It takes work. <laughs> yeah. there's, 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 no, there's no manual, every charity does not different. Right. Um, I have some nonprofits who've, who've approached plan giving very differently. Um, one uh, threw me a little bit and it's worked out really well for them. Um, so everyone kind of de decides, here's what our organization is, here's our group of givers, here's how we would profile them, um, and then just talking about what the best way we think to approach that. Information's huge. We're in a society where people don't just trust you anymore. They want to know why. They want to have the tools. Google does not give them the tools. It doesn't. Um, Google has a lot of information. You can find just about anything you want to know. Um, but you can also find it, it's overwhelming. Um, so you really need to set up, you know, when we start talking stage two plan giving, that's what I talk about the trust. A lot of the nonprofits that do that actually set up estate planning seminars for their base. Um, and bring in the donors, actually? Bring in the donors, yep. And that way they learn. That's huge. Um, because we can't control what everyone's different attorney is telling them. Um, God forbid their do-it-yourself wills online. <laughs> things like that that happen all the time but nothing that we want you know we have no control over they're not having their conversations they're not no one's looking at their balance sheet to say hey you're already giving you have this asset you're you're paying a lot of taxes every year you ever thought of this um sometimes they just don't know any better to ask um, and that's where most of us fit honestly most of us just wouldn't know unless we were asked about it so it does take an individual <coughs> touch um, but a lot of times you have the base to support it. Did I answer your question? Maybe gave you too much? <laughs> nope, it's fine. Anything else? Because you, um, you answered one of my other questions was to keep in touch. Yep. Because I think that is kind of our art auction. That's kind of our other events we do that can bring in these components to keep them Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes, you know, when, you, when you're planning a giving program, as we're starting, a lot of uh, charities will do different community events too, which Habitat already does. It's just about inviting more of the community members to come and have a picnic afterwards, to come do this. And because that's all gonna help build the planning giving side. But what we don't forget is, that might be our intent, but while we're building planned giving, we're building current donations too, because it happens at the same time. But it's the way it helps us keep in touch. Hey, we had to build today, we're all gonna go to this park, here's what we're gonna plan. We plan a little event, we plan a little carnival, we do, we have a barbecue one night in the summer to keep in touch. Can you imagine just inviting um, like a couple key donors or people that are interested in Habitat to a home dedication? Mm -hmm. I mean, Absolutely. that would be to let them see the end effect if they've never been to one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's making ways to invite people into that. So even if we had, you know, if you ended up doing a type of seminar, let's say, and we brought in a couple different financial advisors, a CPA and a state planning attorney to kind of talk about this kind of stuff, it's having a video of that. It's ways, how can we let people see that without being there? Yeah. They want to look at it on their phone. Even our older generations are starting to get there too. Um, so is there a way for us to like live stream one of those? Things like that allow you to make touches with those people to stay in touch. It feels personal still, um, but it's not. You know, it's, it allows us to do more with limited resources. So we look at different things like that as well. You can send out an email blurb and say, hey everyone, look at our 150th. And for no, no more than two minutes, because no one watches a video over two minutes. In fact, most people will shut a video down if it's over 45 seconds. Again, all the little research that goes into things. But what 45 seconds really would captivate your givers and make them think, wow, that's amazing. You know what, that's what I wanna do with my estate plan. That's how I wanna handle this IRA that's just been annoying me. Um, or that life insurance policy I found out my mom and dad bought. Those are Gerber policies, by the way, yeah. most of them. <laughs> um, our, a lot of people's parents bought Gerber life insurance policies. You pass away, you never included it in your estate plan because you didn't know about it. It's a headache for me. That's why I'm discovering them. I'm being very proactive. <laughs> I don't want that to happen when my clients pass away. Um, but we have things like they're out there, assets that are readily available, um, and people don't realize they can use them to give. All right. Very good. All right. Hopefully I didn't throw too much at you. I'm gonna shut this off. <laughs>